So, Frode, uh, over to you. Thank you, Vint. And um, just to embarrass you, what time is it where you are? Uh, it's 6.32 in the morning. Yeah, thank you immensely to be here. So I will try to explain um, what we're introducing today. But one thing I cannot explain is how excited I am to be with you today, everyone, and to present this. It's um, unbelievably exciting. So let's not waste more time on that. First, I need to hide you guys in the corner so I can read my own screen. Right. So what we're presenting today is what we call visual meta. The problem addressed is that academic PDFs lack access to digital affordances beyond the web link. And our aim is to give academic PDFs metadata to enable rich interactions, views, and robust citing. Our approach is to add a few words to an appendix. You all know most books, one of the first pages, it has all kinds of stuff about the book. And you also know PDFs normally have nothing. So basically, the core idea is to take that kind of information and like we've done with all the conference papers for this conference, which is so absurdly exciting, is at the very end of the document, at the end of the paper, there is now visual meta. That is just an amazingly big thing. So what is visual meta actually? Well, it's inspired by BibTech. So for those of you who know BibTech, it will look strangely familiar, slightly odd. It starts with visual meta start and it ends with visual meta end. This is supposed to be very human readable. This is not programming code. Inside that we have wrappers. We have a header that says what version of visual meta it is. And today we have version 1.1. 1.0 is what we've been doing all the testing in the last few months, an incredible team that you will be introduced to at the end. We have managed to put a dot one at the end of it. So this bit is just the actual bib tech that you would find on the download page of an academic document. 100% normal. There is also introductory text because the idea is that yes, PDFs are not fantastic in many ways, but the displayed surface on PDFs is very, very robust. We expect them to be around for hundreds of years, and uh, Vint and I may not be around to tell people how to get value out of it. So we write it in normal human language in the introduction. So this is what we have for the ACM hypertext, but this is what it is for the full visual meta as it stands today. I'm gonna to run through all the sections briefly. Uh, if you're interested, you may wanna watch the video again because it's a bit of a whirlwind. Before the visual meta, we're looking at putting in a document hash. So we have ways of really identifying it's the right document. Then we skip past what we already have. And we have an extensions bit. In the extensions bit, we have what we feel is a solution to naming in BibTech being ambiguous. In here, we say first name, middle name, last name, Arabic written name, Chinese written name, really doesn't matter what it is. And also contact information, because as you can see, it says what it is. So parsing software can extract what it feels is relevant to the user. After that, there's an opportunity to put in the entire references from the document in the standard format. You can also put in the headings so the, so the system knows where the headings are in the document, which is very useful for doing things like finding, folding, and so on. Also, this can produce an interactive glossary as well as a static glossary which can enable when you're authoring a more concept focused style of writing. Endnotes can of course be interactive. And this is where anything goes. You can add anything you like to visual meta. You just have to say what it is. We're experimenting with putting the entire text of the document into visual meta to help with analysis and formatting because line breaks and so can be really iffy in normal PDF. And then after the visual meta in a new page, we're looking at how to do an errata. It would essentially be the same as in the olden days of putting in a piece of paper saying where the changes are, so that it is still richly connected to the document. Current implementations, we have a really, really cool timeline. I'm sure you've all seen citation timelines. What is unique with what Adam and Marcus made here is the fact that any 
visual meta enabled PDF can just slot into this. We've also enabled such things as from a PDF, you can copy text, paste it in a word processor as a citation. Because the copy clipboard includes the selected text and the bib tech part of the visual meta. This is shipping in our software author, which is, of course, the writing part and reader, which is the reading part. Many other features that are visual meta related, including folding finding, interactive glossary and concept mapping. Um, author costs a little bit of money to unlock, but of course, any of you guys send me a message. I'll give you a free code. We really want the community to use this, but at the same time, we have to fund a little bit of the R&D. Benefits. A little bit of a list here. Advanced interactions while reading. There's many things happening to writing software. It should also be available when reading. Augmented citing we looked at. Citing today is absolutely horrible. You know, we have copy and paste. But as you all know from being part of this conference, when you come to do the reference at the end, there can be mistakes, there can be all kinds of issues. If you can do a copy and paste citation, it's much more robust. It enables computational text to use Vint's language. For instance, you can have a, an equation, maths, in the document. Because the visual meta refers to where it is, it can allow the reader software to make it interactive. It also, as well as surfacing to the reader software, it can surface to servers including things like if there is a graph inside, it can say what the X, Y axis actually means and so on. It is legacy safe, free, open and easy to implement. In our book, The Future of Text, I wrote it by hand. In our software, of course, it does it automatically. And we have parsers that we're building that will give away to anybody who wants to put it in their software. Finally, it's robust. And this is maybe the most important part because it's not hidden in some kind of a package inside a piece of software, it can even be printed, scanned, OCR'd, and no metadata is lost. So you can store things for whatever period of time. In closing, this is part of the Future of Text initiative, which is also the Future of Text book and symposium. If you're interested in that, get in touch or search Future of Text. Unfortunately, you'll find us, which is a bit scary, and that's basically all. Uh, Bint will also be featuring this in his October issue of ACM Communications, and we are, of course, talking to other conferences and journals about how to implement this. You are the pilot. You are the first. This is just amazing. We've been doing it in many scattered ways, but to have it in this prestigious organization is wonderful. But please, think about what you can do with this. A lot of you are technical in different ways. This is entirely possible. You can do magic stuff with this. We have only done the beginning. And very finally, I'd like to thank the team, all of whom are mentioned here, including my people at the University of Southampton and everybody from being here today. And if you want to chat online, uh, at Liquid is Liquidizer at uh, Twitter, and you can find out anything like Mark Anderson put in the chat at visual-meta.info. Thank you very much. and I. I think Owen said we have time for a couple of questions. We do, uh, Frodo, Vint, thank you very much. Uh, so folks, uh, do you have any questions? Just remembering that this session is being recorded. So please uh, use the raise hand function or if anybody wants to jump in with a question. Well, since I'm not hearing any questions, it's Vince Surf. I'll ask one. Uh, actually, Frode, I was thinking about the first name, last name construct and thinking about the fact that that's very Western. I wonder whether we should have family name and given name as an alternative uh, way of, of characterizing so that we don't, uh, we don't impose a Western view necessarily on the authors. Yes, for the next conference, I think we should do that. And also, I hope it will be more non-Western so we'll have different characters as well. But we should actually, we should absolutely consider the naming of the titles as well. Yes. Good point. And also not to confuse people, but we're looking at a lot of ways to, to go with this. We have a meeting group of us every Monday and Friday. And yesterday, what we discussed is how we can have video with this. So if we have a transcript, let's say, of a conference like this, how that could go into a PDF, but because of the visual meta, it can actually refer to having the video of refer to bits play and line and connect to each other. So the PDF becomes an EDL, basically a playlist. And there are many things 
basically, if you say what the data is, you can do things with it, right? And I'll waffle on a little bit until hopefully someone will cut me off. The one of the oh, uh, Alco. Yeah, so I guess this is a great initiative, and I'm happy also to see that it's not going to be just a one-time effort. And I think the ACM and the Sheridan publisher really helps you in get setting up a process for getting this done also for other conferences. So what will be your future steps in order to get this into the world and that people actually are going to make use of this? Um, Vince, um, I think the answer to that from both of us is to use our network to show that this pilot exists. Uh, we have uh, Vint, of course, is hugely connected. Not only did he make the connected internet, but he himself is the most connected person I've ever met. <laughs> so we are in in talk with a lot of different uh, organizations, and it's you know we've been talking to them gently, but now it exists with you guys. It's much easier to say, go to this site, download it, uh, play with it. So I, I, I promise you, um, this is not something that we're casual about. Um, I know, um, obviously, at least half of you are fans of Hamilton, the musical, and he, in there he says when he has a problem, he can write, you know, I can write my way out of this. You know, this is the 31st of August. A major war just ended today in the most horrible way. We're dealing with climate change. So many things. Text will be a part of the way we communicate. But if we only work with dumb text, so to speak, we are hamstrung. And this is one way to make the text have some context and rich interactivity. If someone does something better, that would be great. We will support that. But at least it's a kick in the right direction, I think. Uh, Mr. Anderson. I just really was going to point out, because I'm, I'm sort of surprised so no one has said, you know, why BibTech? And just to, to reinforce words from your, your um, talk, that it's really the best of the bad choices at the moment. It needs to be something that's human readable, and you're pretty much stuck with BibTech or RAS. But the way to think a big, about BibTech is not so much as it being the absolute core, it's basically the life raft that gets our data con construct to the point where enough people say, up with this, we will not put, we'll, and we'll, we'll deliberately design something better for the long term. And I think that's the way to see it. There, you know, there are many things not to like about BibTech, and it, it sort of doesn't even really know the web exists. Um, but, you know, it's where we are. Yeah, absolutely, Mark. Um, and, and the thing I wanted to waffle is actually quite important. That is, um, I'm a gamer, Battlefield, I love it. I read an interview with the creators of Crisis, one of those wide open worlds many years ago. Ironically, I can't find the article to cite it, where the developer says, AI isn't that hard. What is hard is to make sure that everything in the environment knows what it is. A piece of wood knows if it can burn, how much weight before it breaks, all of that stuff. That's why you can run around and have fun as a child in a computer game. But our documents do not know what they are. We've all downloaded academic documents. And we can't even find the date it was published, right? So this is an attempt so that the documents can be active agents of their own knowledge in a rich interactive environment. This is The dream is not that different from what we've been talking about for decades and decades. But the benefit we have is I am just a small independent developer and a PhD student. I don't have bosses to prove anything to. And people like Mark, who was here today, we can afford to do it in a little, little way. You know, when we try to explain to other people what we're devoting our life to, and we're saying it's writing a few lines of text at the end of a document, it's ridiculous. It's so unimpressive. But it is maybe the simplest thing we can get over the next hurdle, like Mark was saying. Please, one more question from someone who knows nothing about this. Sorry. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to ask Dave Miller to say something because He's my supervisor, one of three. And Dave, without your scaffolding and support, um, this, this wouldn't have gotten anywhere near uh, realization. Um, but um, there he is. The kids must be in school because his video is working. <laughs> Yes, you're right. They're not. They're not streaming Netflix for once. Um, yeah, no. I, I mean, I just wanted to echo what you said. Really, that that really this is about trying to create the next generation of self-aware documents, um, and it's about um, incremental change. And it's saying, you know, we have an entire ecosystem in academic publishing built around PDFs. You know, we've got to the point of having things like the ACM Digital Library, um, but the PDFs that you get are, are, are dumb documents. They don't know what they are. You can't do anything with them. 
So with this little bit of augmentation, you start to get an awful lot of power. Um, and let's see where it leads to. Uh, so you know, every, every paper in this conference will have visual meta attached to it within the digital library. Um, and we're hoping that in future, we will be able to expand that to other events in the, in the ACM and, and get the word out. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Uh, thank you all very much, uh, Froda, Vint, uh, Dave, for your words there. I think Visual Meta is a very, very exciting initiative, and it's one which I wish all the very best. And I think it connects very interestingly to what will be our first keynote, which will happen in just over 10 minutes, which talks about what happens when documents get destroyed. How do you try to reconstitute them, discover where they might be, bring them back together into their previous cohesive collection to make sense of them? And I think, you know, in a way, the physical documents can be brittle. We've seen just how brittle digital documents, particularly their connectedness to each other, can be. Uh, and hypertext is about that connection, the hyper part of it. So I, I really hope Visual Meta is, is a success. I believe with your support it will be. Um, so I'd like to thank you very much for that. Thank you, Ilko, for introducing the program. Uh, we're going to wrap up this session now. Folks, you can stay on Zoom because this is where the keynote will happen. Uh, but we have about a 10 minute break. So go get a coffee or whatever beverage happens to be suitable yeah. for your time zone. <laughs> and um, we will see you back here in about 10 minutes. Vint, uh, Froda, thank you very much.